Welcome to the Abide in Me podcast, where we're countering the malaise of modern culture and superficial spirituality by taking aim at the truth. We'll be looking for answers to the big life questions. What was our origin? Where can we find meaning and purpose? How do we discern between good and evil? Fact and fiction and what is our ultimate destination you can find more content on our youtube channel aim radio or follow us on instagram all links and resources are provided in the podcast notes enjoy this week's episode I'm going to talk about perennialism today and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most people who say that they are spiritual today subscribe to this worldview. It forms the basis of modern spirituality, the new age. It formed the basis of theosophy. It was the belief system of author Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, and also Joseph Campbell, who wrote The Hero's Journey. It can be summed up with the idea that there are many paths to God. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, because essentially, in their essence, all religions are the same. There is a central knowledge and truth that permeates them all, and that different religions are just different cultural expressions of these perennial truths And if we all understood this, that there was this underlying unity between all these schools of thought, then all of the division and the arguing and the wars and everything else would cease. It's certainly something that I used to believe in, because of course the focus is unity and love. It's looking for commonalities, rather than thinking about all of the things that divide us. And so it's very, very appealing because it makes us feel and seem very compassionate and tolerant and accepting of all different religions, of all different kinds of people, from all different kinds of backgrounds and belief systems. It allows us to believe that we can all reside in this mutual love, respect and tolerance. That is the goal, that is the apex of the pyramid, that is the aim. The aim is love and unity and tolerance and acceptance and compassion. I'm going to play you a a little clip from a Russell Brand video in a minute that he did, where he articulates it really well. And part of what he says is, spirituality is about oneness and religiosity is about separation and division. And so today, if you say that you subscribe to a particular religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, then you're put in the compartment of the religious. If only these religious people would stop fighting and get their act together and realise that all religions are essentially leading everyone to the same place, there would be world peace, or at least we'd get there a bit sooner. The problem is that all religions don't lead to the same place. They don't have the same goal. They don't really have the same starting point. There are certainly commonalities between them. Maybe the golden rule, treat other people as you would want to be treated. Maybe there is a focus in all of them on love, on being kind, on some kind of justice. But they certainly don't lead to the same place. Nirvana is not heaven. Heaven is not a new heavens and a new earth. Justice is either doled out by a personal God or justice is dealt with by an impersonal force of karma. And so even though it's really tempting to hold this kind of belief system that all religions are leading to the same place, Once you start to look at the different religions and what they are teaching, what they focus on, we can see that that simply isn't the case. 
what people who are perennialists will then do is dismiss the core teaching of each of the religions. And they'll say, no, 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 those aren't the core teachings. The core teachings are about love and unity. That's what the core teachings are. These religions just don't know it because essentially they're human religions and they're kind of made up. And so they focus on what each different culture wants to focus on. So the perennialists themselves decide what the core of each of these religious traditions is. So it becomes very subjective. It becomes their version of each of these religions and they get to choose which bits they want and which bits they don't. You can see this in the New Age. Even though the New Age is supposed to be bringing all religions together, there is a heavy focus on Hinduism and Buddhism and Eastern traditions. When they bring Jesus or Christianity or Christian teachings into the mix, they take out what they don't like. They make Jesus some kind of Gnostic teacher or Hindu guru, akin to the Buddha. In fact, actually probably teaching exactly the same thing that the Buddha taught, because they themselves want him to be that way. But that's not how we discern the truth. If there is a core of all of these religions, we need to find what it is truthfully, don't we? I mean, they say that it's love, but I could make a, a pretty good case that the core of all religions is actually the resurrection. I could say that the resurrection of Jesus is the truth because that's the core of Christianity. And I could say that Hinduism and Buddhism has shades of it. They couldn't quite get there, but they believe in reincarnation and rebirth. And of course, Muslims and Jews believe in a resurrection of everyone at the end of time. So really the core teaching of all of these major religions is the resurrection. But most people who say they're spiritual would not agree with that, but they will agree with the idea of unity and oneness. All is one, all is one. And coming along with that, there really isn't any good and evil. That's the teaching of non-duality. When you get out of this realm of the senses, okay, good and evil ceases to exist. Non-duality, it's just oneness. That is not a teaching of Christianity. That is not a teaching of Islam. That is not a teaching of Judaism. And so when you choose for yourself what the core of all of these religions is, you just make up your own religion and call it the truth. Well, people have been doing that for millennia. And so even though it sounds like a very modern and tolerant and accepting worldview, when you start to look into it, it's just another subjective worldview that makes people feel better. So I'm going to play this clip of Russell Brand. I've had criticisms of him before and other people who have claimed to be on what they would call a path of enlightenment through meditation, transcendental meditation, yoga, whatever, but when they actually look out into the world, you can tell that they have absolutely no discernment in terms of what's actually happening in reality. And I've said the same thing about people like Eckhart Tolle, another one who is claiming enlightenment to a higher degree than most of us. Yet when Russell Brand was questioning him about the World Economic Forum and their plans like the Great Reset or the Green New Deal, he just said, no, 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 there's no plan. There's no plan. These people are just stupid. Showing that he has absolutely no knowledge of what's going on in the world. He has no discernment. He even went as far to say that we don't need any more intelligence on the planet. We don't need any more intelligence. We just need to calm our minds. We just need peace. No, there's no nefarious plan. All these people at the World Economic Forum who talk constantly about what their plan is, no, that doesn't exist. And so often people who claim they're on a path to enlightenment because they're doing a lot of meditation and seeking out peace actually have no idea what's going on in the world. And Russell Brand used to be more like this. He's actually doing some good videos at the moment of everything that's been happening with COVID and Trump and everything else. So he seems to have seen the light a bit more and come down from his transcendental pedestal into the real world. And so I commend him for that. But the reason that I'm going to play this video clip is that it highlights some of the problems with perennial thinking. 
I would argue that spirituality brings people together. Religiosity can drive people apart. Spirituality is about accepting a oneness. Religiosity can be about this set of ideas is better than this one. I know a lot of you guys are Christians and I love you for your Christianity and I love our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. However, personally, I would not prohibit arriving at transcendence or enlightenment via the teachings of the Buddha, who obviously presents us with an ideology that does not have a Godhead. Or our brothers and sisters, to quote my dear friend Cornel West, who would say that Islam is another pathway to enlightenment. And so the reason that I highlighted that was he's showing very clearly how he's trying to merge the three religions that he mentioned, Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam. But then he says he doesn't preclude that the path laid out by the Buddha will lead you towards enlightenment. And then he says the same about Islam, being a path towards enlightenment. Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad, for that matter, were not teaching people to reach enlightenment. Enlightenment within Buddhism is about reaching nirvana and letting go of the self, recognising that you don't really exist and that you need to let go of your ego, let go of your desires so that suffering can cease. Those are not the teachings of Christianity or Islam. So we need to be careful with terms. I've seen in some perennial literature that they will use the words salvation and enlightenment interchangeably. So maybe this is what Russell Brand's doing here, that he thinks that these words are interchangeable or they are synonymous, that salvation is the same as enlightenment, but it isn't. And this is the problem when you don't know enough about all of these different religious faiths. And even if you do, you dismiss the bits that you don't like or just redefine them. So it's really interesting when he said, I love our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That's quite a statement. He also says earlier that he says the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so the Lord's Prayer is the prayer that Jesus, the Lord, gave to his disciples. That's why it's called the Lord's Prayer. When they're asking him, what do we pray for? We don't know how to pray. He says, just pray this. Don't be like the hypocrites heaping up lots of words. This is the prayer. And of course, who are we praying to? We're praying to our Father. And so what perennialists will want to do, and I think this is probably what Russell Brand is doing, is saying that our Father isn't the God of the Bible. Our Father is just something we say when we are pointing towards Brahman, which is the Hindu concept of God. Brahman and the God of the Bible are not the same. So I understand why people want to merge it all together. But by doing so, they rinse the meaning and the context of each of these particular schools of thought. There is no God, as he rightly pointed out, in Buddhism. And so how can all paths lead to the same place. And so I think it's a reaction to the certainty that comes with a lot of religious faiths that people will interpret as arrogance. They only really do this with Christianity, I have to say. You don't get many people saying about Buddhism, oh, these Buddhists, I mean, oh, they're so arrogant that they think, you know, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path are the only way to enlightenment. You only really get that kind of sentiment with Christianity. Who do these Christians think they are that they've got it all sewn up? How arrogant. Because certainty is now frowned upon. People like to be agnostic which is why this kind of perennial blending of traditions is seen by people to be more spiritual. Being agnostic 
and just focusing on love and unity and compassion and tolerance and acceptance is seen to be more spiritual. We're now on a higher plane of existence if we say all religions are basically the same at their core. And anyone who says any different is judgmental and arrogant and exclusive. All religions are exclusive. All religions are making truth claims, but so is perennialism. So is the new age. The truth claim that they're making is that agnosticism is right. It's the right position to take. The other truth claim they're making is that all religions lead to the same place. And so even though it sounds inclusive, it actually isn't, because if you don't believe that, you're excluded. So anyone who's making a truth claim, even if it sounds inclusive, is by definition excluding people who don't believe that. But So this is why you have to be really careful to really listen to what people are saying. When someone claims that they love the Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, they're saying something very specific if they know what the Christian teaching is. The Christian teaching, well, let's start with this. Why is Christ Lord and Saviour? What did he do to earn that title, if you like? When he was on earth teaching, people mostly called him rabbi, which means teacher. So why is he Lord and Saviour? What does Lord mean? What does Saviour mean in Christianity? All of that is tied in with the resurrection. The resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Christ. Christ being the only begotten son of God who incarnated into this realm, who was killed, who was resurrected bodily. And that particular action in the Christian faith made atonement for the sins of the world. Now, if you want to look at that kind of in a narrative sense or a mythical sense, or you want to think about the psychology of it, in other words, if you don't think that's a true historical event, then you can kind of merge it with rebirth or maybe merge it with reincarnation some way and kind of go, oh yeah, they're all really talking about the same thing. But Jesus didn't teach anything about reincarnation. And he wasn't a Hindu mystic. In other words, the teaching of Christianity isn't that we are all divine, that we're all just sparks of divinity, that are having a human experience and that we'll all universally go back from whence we came. The very idea of an atonement for sins means that we've done something wrong that has separated us from God. That is pretty much non-existent in modern spirituality. The idea that we've done something wrong is actually offensive to a lot of people. And so when people talk about spirituality today, as Russell Brand said, they they think about oneness. That's the first thing. He also listed some other attributes, things like service to others, kindness, love, He sort of mentioned transcendence. And then he says something along the lines of, listen, there are ways in which I behave, which I think are going to serve me better. So I'm not going to be selfish as much as I can. I'm going to focus on others. But I don't think that spirituality is about telling other people what to do. Because, of course, the worst thing you can do as someone who is spiritual these days is be judgmental. But if there is some kind of good way to behave, okay, some kind of Tao, some kind of way, then shouldn't we be sharing that with other people? I mean, not to be condemning people all the time, but if there's a way in which we should be behaving in order to be better people, wouldn't it be a good idea to share that with other people? So on the one hand, you accept the moral law, but then you say you don't want to push it on other people. Well, isn't that detrimental to them? Isn't that, in fact, not being kind if you don't want to correct people? This idea of how dare you tell other people what to do. This is very modern. This is very modern. I mean, we have laws, don't we? 
And so there are right ways to behave and wrong ways to behave. And that has been almost obliterated with what we have today, which is subjective morality. And so what he's saying is my spirituality is my own. I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to do what I think is right. And I'm going to let you do the same. He's also someone that talks a lot about community and coming together. I mean, that's the whole idea of coexisting, isn't it? Coming together to work together. But you can't have both. You can't have a a super sense of individuality in terms of your spirituality. And then at the same time, talk about community. If you're living in a community, you need a set of shared values. And if some of the people in that community don't adhere to them, then they need to be called out and corrected. Otherwise, that community is going to fall apart. So you don't want to be judgmental and you don't want to tell other people what to do, but you do want to live in a community But also you're very individualistic and you want to just have your own spirituality where you don't tell anyone what to do and you just focus on yourself. It's incoherent is basically what I'm saying. And this lack of coherence is a problem within the new age of modern spirituality and in any kind of system that tries to just bring together traditions that teach different things and have a completely different end point. And so enlightenment kind of gets rebranded as exhibiting the traits of compassion and acceptance and tolerance at all times. And it it comes from a good place. It comes from the place of wanting to see the good in everyone and thinking, yeah, this person that's done this terrible thing, something terrible must have happened to them. And so I'm going to have compassion for that person because, of course, we've all done terrible things and we've all acted in ways that we regret. And so we always take the position of giving people the benefit of the doubt, first of all, and treating everyone essentially the same, which, of course, is being inclusive in modern parlance. But how can we treat everyone the same? This is this idea of universalism, which comes out of perennialism. It's also within certain branches of Christianity, which says that all people are going to be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done, all people are going to the same place. And it's the same with perennialism. But how can all people be treated the same? There's an idea of judgment and justice in all of these traditions, as I said, it's either through karma or through the judgment of a god. There is a moral law within all of these traditions, which means some things are good, some things are evil. You can choose which path to take, but there's a definite differentiation. So if you've been on an evil path your whole life, doesn't matter what religion you are, shouldn't there be consequences? Don't all religions, in fact, teach that there will be consequences, whether you'll be born into a lower life form or a harsher life? as a punishment for the way you've behaved in this life, or whether you will be judged and punished in a different way in Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Christ, after all, is the judge. So how can we say we're universalists? It sounds nice, but when you start to think about it, is it really just and fair that we are completely inclusive? Or do we need some exclusivity? Should people who are child rapists be treated the same as people who are loving and good people and have tried their best? And it's a way of not having to judge, not having to think, not having to seem harsh with people. We don't like judgment, but we like justice. In fact, we crave justice and fairness. That's what all this talk about inclusivity and equity is about. We want justice, whether it's social justice or just justice for ourselves and our families. But we don't like judgment, but you can't have justice without judgment. Okay, you need to separate the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. That is a craving that we all have, that justice is done. So we can't be universalists. And this is a very common situation that we have these days, not just within spiritual circles, but in general. We like to have beliefs 
that make us feel good, it doesn't matter if they're incoherent. We don't care. We just want to feel good or sound good to other people or sound as if we're on a higher plane of existence. But not only are they incoherent, we don't even live them out. We don't even act as if we believe these things in the world. And so even though it sounds nice to be a universalist and to focus only on love and compassion and tolerance and inclusivity, when you get down to it, none of us actually believe that. None of us really believe that. And so if you're having a discussion, actually this happened um, quite recently with Russell Brand and Jordan Peterson. When you're having a discussion about a difficult topic, the trump card that you can always play, which is the card that Russell Brand tried to play with Jordan Peterson when they were talking about some of the trans issues, the trump card is always, why can't you be more compassionate? Why are you annoyed about this? Why are you angry about this? Why are you getting upset about this? Why can't you see it from other people's point of view? Why aren't you more tolerant? And in this day and age, that trumps any kind of argument because what you're doing is making the other person seem cruel and judgmental, almost in an arbitrary sense. You've gone from discussing the topic and the facts about whatever topic you're talking about And you've moved it into the realm of emotion by saying, why can't you just be more compassionate? And it's the trump card. People do it all the time when they're losing an argument. So there's nothing wrong with being angry and upset and outraged about some of the things that are happening in the world. And obviously different subjects are going to get different people going. And there's nothing wrong with being judgmental. In fact, we need to be judgmental. We need to have discernment. And we need to see through these kinds of tactics where people try and take the argument into the emotional realm. Oh, well, I guess I'm just more forgiving than you are. Okay. Is that true? Often when people say that and I look at their lives, (laughs) I know very well that they are preaching and not practicing. It's too easy to accuse other people of not being forgiving, of not being inclusive, of not being compassionate, of not being tolerant, of not being loving enough or understanding enough or empathetic enough. It's very easy to use these terms to win an argument, to make other people feel bad so they back down from their position. But we need the discernment to see through these tactics because some of the things that are happening in the world are incredibly evil and incredibly serious And we need to be able to talk about them. And we need to allow people who are are upset about them to also express those emotions if they so choose. So Jordan Peterson is angry with the trans agenda being pushed onto children. Then fair enough in my book. And equally, if Russell Brand is angry about the corporate takeover that appears to be happening, this massive transfer of wealth that happened through COVID... Fair enough. I don't expect people to sit there and say to him, hey, listen, Russell, you know, there's two sides to every story and you really need to be more compassionate about all these people that work in these corporations, okay? We understand why he's angry about that and I understand why Jordan Peterson gets a bit het up about children being persuaded to change their sex by adults who essentially are just trying to make money out of them. So we can all play the trump card of you need to be more compassionate, you need to be more loving, but it doesn't help us get to the truth. And so another part of perennialism and modern spirituality, and this is a very Gnostic idea, it's the idea that this reality that we perceive through our five senses is not the place where we're going to ascertain the truth. We need to transcend and elevate ourselves to another level of existence in order to actually see the truth. And I think that's what people mean when they talk about enlightenment these days. Enlightenment seems to mean peace, like trying to be peaceful all the time. It means not thinking as much, okay, focusing on the present moment, having having fewer thoughts in general. But it also means elevating yourself up onto a higher plane of existence where you only see the world through compassionate eyes. So 
when you look at statues of the Buddha, who exemplifies enlightenment, you could say, the statues of him are with his eyes half closed. I don't want to follow someone who has their eyes half closed. I want to follow someone who has their eyes wide open. I don't want to detach from this world just to bring me peace. I don't want to cultivate feelings of self-love or compassion just so that I can look down from on high and say, oh, yes, all this evil stuff that's going on in the world. First of all, there's no good and evil anyway. And if you see it from a higher perspective, it's just a game. We're just working stuff out. Everyone's going to go back to the same place and we don't really need to worry about anything because it's all an illusion anyway. That isn't spiritual to me. I was certainly enamoured with those kinds of ideas at one point. And the main reason was that I was traumatised by my life. Totally traumatised. And so when you're in that kind of state, as many people are in the new age and modern spirituality, or they're just apathetic and they don't care, and they just want to focus on themselves... But if you have been traumatised by life, and Russell Brand talks about his addictions and how through that process he became more spiritual, so he himself would have been more traumatised. It just feels better to believe in these new age teachings of detachment and unity and love and non-duality and there is no good and evil and let's all not judge each other and float off the planet. Of course it feels good, but just because something feels good, it doesn't mean it's good for you. It might feel good to, you know, have a spliff every night or a bottle of wine. doesn't mean it's good for you. A lot of people today will say, oh, that teacher, I love that teacher so much. This teacher's really helped me. And then you kind of talk to them about what that particular teacher has said. It's like, yeah, no wonder it's helped you. They've either told you to totally focus on yourself and essentially that you're never wrong, that your perception of reality is always right because your inner spiritual intuitions are always right, okay? You do you, you live your best life. Of course you're going to like that teacher who tells you that. Of course you're going to like teachers who talk about focusing on the present moment and drifting off into some transcendental reality. It doesn't, matter. It doesn't mean that that is helping you. It just means that you like it. And so as with many people who claim to love Jesus... They are loving on the wrong Jesus, a fake Christ, a Jesus of their own imagination who they have created for themselves to be palatable. And that is not Jesus. Jesus isn't palatable. That is something that you find out pretty quickly when you start reading the New Testament. Not palatable. This is the verse. I love this verse because it was the verse that really snapped me out of the caricature that is portrayed in our society about Jesus. Jesus, Prince of Peace, he's going to forgive everyone, he loves everyone. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Wow. Luke Chapter 12, verse 51. Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? Yes, that's what we think. And he says no. He didn't come to bring peace, to lull us to sleep, to tell us that we're all very, very good girls and boys and usher us into heaven or nirvana or wherever else people think they're going. He came to separate the wheat and the chaff, to talk to people about their wrongdoing. Their wrongdoing. What is it that we have done wrong if we actually sat down and thought about it? I see a lot of people today who say things like, oh, I've tried everything and now I'm going off to try ayahuasca or DMT or something to solve all my problems. I've tried it all. But what a lot of people haven't tried is actually thinking about what they've done wrong. I've said this so many times before in regards to therapy. When people go to therapy, they talk about the things that have happened to them. They rarely talk about the things that they've done that will be weighing on them because they feel guilty and they feel shame about them. And most of the time they should do. But we are told, essentially, there is no wrongdoing because we get to decide what's good and bad, right and wrong. 
we get to justify our own behaviour. And so here's another great verse, this time from the Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, from his first letter in the New Testament. If we say we have no sin, sin being moral wrongdoing, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Him being Jesus, who said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfil it. And so this moral law that was given in the Old Testament to Moses, the Ten Commandments, he didn't come to abolish it. He came to tell us to do it. To do it. To do good in the world. Yes, there is a right way to behave and a wrong way to behave. And we are supposed to correct each other. Not because we are self-righteous, but because we know that we've been made in a certain way and that when we do good, we actually feel better. Granted, not always immediately, but that's because we've been fed on this subjective morality for so long that we just go around justifying all of our behaviour as being good. And that is a self-delusion, isn't it? Is everything you do good? Is everything you do justified? You might be able to justify it. Oh, I snapped at that person because I was feeling tired and because I was in a traffic jam. And yeah, yeah, I get it. You can justify all of your actions. I can justify all of my wrongdoing by saying that I had a traumatic childhood, which is true. But I still did things that were very wrong and very hurtful towards people. These are the things that we are supposed to be acknowledging. Because in acknowledging, in turning, we will release that burden. And when we release these burdens and stop justifying our behaviour and actually following the way that Jesus laid out, we are going to feel better. But we've been fueling ourselves with self-delusions and lies for so long that it's going to be hard to switch to the truth. It's going to be hard to switch from lying to telling the truth. It's going to be hard to stop gossiping and backbiting. It's going to be hard to not lust after people or watch porn. It's going to be hard to not indulge ourselves with whatever food, drink and drugs we want. It's going to be hard. But when we switch over to the real fuel, we're going to feel so much better. we just got to get over the hump in the short term. And so the true fuel is the truth. It's not love. And actually the love that people talk about isn't actually love. It's acceptance, compassion and tolerance. That's not love. When we love our children, we discipline them. Sometimes we have to be cruel to be kind. We have to put guardrails up. We certainly don't tolerate their behaviour all the time just to be compassionate. So the idea of love has even been watered down to be a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling. That's not love. And so the teachings that Jesus gave, which you can read in the New Testament, and also the the letters of the apostles, are so true that we can actually feed on them. They give us strength. They give us courage. They set us on the right path. They cleanse us. They transform us. And isn't that what people want? But what do people want to be transformed from and into? If we're saying in modern spirituality there's nothing really wrong with us, what do we want to be transformed into? Do we want to be a better person? What does that mean? I want to be more spiritual. What does that mean? And so we need to really, really think about what are we doing with all this spirituality? Because when we use words like transformation and oneness and unity and love, we're not really saying anything. We need to start by truly taking stock of who we are. Not pretending that we're perfect or we've done nothing wrong. Because if we can't even do that, then all we're going to be doing is masking 
all of our problems, all of our issues, all of our moral wrongdoing or sin. We're just going to be masking it. And that's not true transformation. It's the truth that sets you free. Not self-delusion, indulgence and lies. The truth. Being able to judge for yourself what the truth is about yourself. That is very difficult, by the way. That is very difficult to see ourselves clearly. So sometimes we do need help from other people with that part. But if we can't see ourselves clearly, it's going to be very difficult for us to change. And I think one of the reasons why people today find certainly the caricature of Christianity so off-putting is that we don't understand this idea of sacrifice anymore. I mean, first of all, we don't think we've done anything wrong and how dare you even judge me and tell me that I have, but also the idea of sacrifice as a way of cleansing and purifying us. And so the idea in the Old Testament, and not just with the the Jews, but in general, if you are worshipping gods, you're giving them offerings, you're sacrificing something to appease them with the pagan gods who are very capricious, but with God to atone for sin, making a sacrifice to atone for sin. And so that was so much part of their worldview that they would have completely understood Jesus's sacrifice. No greater love is there than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. That's what he said to his disciples before he went off to be crucified. No greater love is there than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. He was the sacrifice. But because we don't understand this process of sacrifice, it just seems completely incomprehensible to our modern minds. And it seems incomprehensible to us that we have to pay a price for our moral wrongdoing, a price for our sin. But that's what the sacrifices were all about, paying a price. Now, we might understand it today when we think about criminals who do something wrong and then they get sent to prison and they're paying the price in that way. They've had to sacrifice part of their life and their time and their freedom. But we don't really relate that to ourselves in a spiritual sense because within the spiritual world now, these concepts aren't even there. They're not even there. And if you have a spirituality that leaves out sin, that leaves out sacrifice, that leaves out this need for forgiveness for the things that you've done wrong, or paying the price, paying the penalty for what you've done wrong, then you have a spirituality that is nothing like the teachings of Christ, nor the teachings of the Old Testament, in other words, the Jewish scriptures, nor the teachings of Islam. And so they can't be merged into this universalism. And so if you don't think you need to be forgiven, then you won't understand Christ's sacrifice. It won't make any sense to you. And you won't believe you need to be forgiven if you don't think you've done anything wrong. And this is why modern spirituality in its current form is so dangerous. Because it leads people actually off the true transformational path which is acknowledging when you've done something wrong. That's what repentance is. Acknowledging you've done something wrong, asking for forgiveness from God, who will then purify you and cleanse you and transform you. But if you don't think you've done anything wrong, you're never going to go through that process and you're going to get trapped in this place of pride, essentially, and putting on more and more and more spiritual masks, being more and more and more divorced from the reality of who you are. You'll be living in self-deception. And so you cannot distort the truth and stay sane. And distorting the truth can be the truth about yourself or the truth about the world. Even though it's nice to believe things that aren't true about yourself and the world, 
if you continue to distort the truth, you will not remain sane. And of course, there are degrees of that. Insanity means extreme unreasonableness, if you look it up. Extreme unreasonableness. Can we see that in society today? People who are extremely unreasonable, where we are being told to believe things that are extremely unreasonable. And if you buy into those things, you will not remain sane. This is why we focus on the truth over love, or certainly feelings of love. Yes, love can heal us. It can be a healing balm when we are loved. And certainly the truest love you're ever going to feel is from God. That the truth is going to keep you sane. And in order to see the truth, we need discernment. We need judgment. We can't just buy into these extremely unreasonable ideas that are being pushed in our society today. We might like them. They might sound very inclusive, but they are not actually true. Truth is not subjective. That's just your opinion. That's just your opinion. When people say my truth, it means my opinion, but that is not the truth. And so once we understand that God is a God of justice as well as love, then we understand more Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus gave his life up freely and Jesus was the incarnation of God. So you can say God gave up his life freely to pay the price for our wrongdoing. That's the definition of love, is it not? And so all of these ideas about the incarnation the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons in one being, the idea of Jesus' sacrifice for us, the atonement, paying the price, redeeming us, paying the debt, all of these ideas on the outset are difficult to understand because we're so divorced from them now. But they're actually coherent, which is what we're aiming for, coherence in our ideas, not just good feelings. So it's okay to be exclusive. We're all exclusive in some ways. All religions are exclusive. They believe that their way is the way. The answer to having all of these different religions is not to just try and do a mega mix and pick and choose which bits we like to formulate the ultimate feel-good religion for ourselves. The aim is to look at each of them, what they say, and discern whether it's true or not. We can do that. We're intelligent. We have reason, rationality. We also do have spiritual intuitions. And we can also test these teachings in our own lives. Are the teachings of Buddhism true? Are they going to lead us in the right way? Are they going to transform us? Do they do what they say on the tin or not? And you can do the same with the Christian teachings. So there's lots of ways to discern the truth. And the good thing about Christianity is we have a lot of historical evidence that we can test. And so that's what we're going to be doing. Moving away from perennialism and the feel-good factor of modern spirituality, which actually does bring a malaise. That's why so many people are saying, I've tried everything and nothing works. It's because modern spiritual practices do not do what they say on the tin. That's why you feel like you're spinning your wheels and not getting anywhere. I discovered that by following them myself, and that's what the whole of my previous podcast was about true tales of enlightenment. What's true about this? What's true about Eastern teachings? Now, some of it is true. Of course, there's truth in all religions, but we're trying to find, I guess, the most true, if you like. And it's got to be coherent and it's got to do what it says on the tin. And so I would love, as a lot of people would, to move towards unity. 
And of course, we need to coexist with each other. But hopefully we can actually have some open discussions about the differences between these belief systems and not just dismiss the differences as being the bits that aren't true and focus on the bits that are similar and just assume that they are the bits that are true. It's all too subjective and we are not the best judges when we are just looking through a very subjective lens that is designed to make us feel peaceful. We need to decide between peace and truth often. If we want to just seek peace, we will often disregard the truth because we don't want to feel any pain. We don't want to admit that we're wrong. And so often we do need to choose, unfortunately, between seeking peace and seeking the truth. So I'm going to finish with some words from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. On page 208, I'd encourage everyone to read this book. It's very cleansing for your mind because he is just so good at explaining things. He's talking about this difference between Christians and non-Christians. And I, I think he's explaining a lot of what's happening today. More and more people are becoming interested again in Christ and are leaving other religions because they have found them to not lead them where they want to go. So he says this, there are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians, but who still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen. There are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves so. There are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but who are so strongly attracted by him that they are his in a much deeper sense than they themselves understand. There are people in other religions who are being led by God's secret influence to concentrate on those parts of their religion which are in agreement with Christianity and who thus belong to Christ without knowing it. And always, of course, there are a great many people who are just confused in mind and have a lot of inconsistent beliefs all jumbled up together. Now, he was writing back in the 1940s. And so we can see that actually nothing much has changed. And that things have actually got a bit worse in terms of people being confused in mind and having a lot of jumbled up ideas. And of course, that is also what causes the malaise. You've got a lot of inconsistent ideas that kind of make you feel good, but you don't have a true foundation to stand on. And so it's confusing. Your mind will be darkened. You'll find it difficult to discern the truth. So that's why I encourage people to start reading the Bible. And I know when I say that, a lot of people groan and kind of roll their eyes. But it really has been a, a, a transformational experience for me. And I love reading and I love history and I love religions and studying all that kind of stuff. But I guess the surprise for me was how much I loved the prophets and the Psalms and the, the beautiful poetry in it, because I'm just not a poetry person at all. And so I think you'll find some books in there that you will be surprised by. Maybe start with the book of Ecclesiastes. That's very Taoist in its tone. One of the wisdom books in the middle of the Bible. I certainly didn't expect to find it in there. And of course, the word of God is alive and active, as it says in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you want some wisdom and you're serious about transformation and you're going to dedicate some time to this, one of the most amazing things that will happen when you're reading the Bible is that you will be led to specific books and letters and scriptures that are exactly right for you. That's part of the great journey of this. And that's the journey that I've been on over the past three, four years. It's such a joy to be led to exactly what you need at exactly the right time. To understand this rich, ancient history and wisdom and truth embodied by Jesus.
And the other benefit of reading certainly the New Testament, is just to get to know who Jesus is. And maybe you won't like him as much anymore. Maybe he'll challenge you. He certainly challenged me. But that's good for us. We're not supposed to be placid and drifting about in the oneness and the love. We're alive. We're here. And we can take action to better our own lives and other people's. But we must look at ourselves in the mirror. And we must look at the world with true discernment. And so I'll finish from a quote from John's Gospel when he's quoting Jesus. And he says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So why don't you take him up on that suggestion? Okay, thanks for listening, everyone. I'll put all of the links the link to the russell brand full video in the podcast notes and anything else that i can think of and i'll speak to you again very soon bye for now